much, everybody. One more time, Elvira. Cassandra, oh, <laughs> first things first, when did you take, what year did you take the first photo as Elvira? Uh, 1981, and that photo was in the book that I have coming out. Um, I was much more serious about myself and my character back then. You'll see when you see the pictures. Well, Cassandra, I was going to say, I hope this isn't inappropriate, but 1981, you still got it. You still got it, Cassandra. You look amazing. Yeah, I know. Everybody here probably wasn't born yet. They're going, 1981. And I was already old in 1981. That's the sad damn thing. I was now, 30. Now, we all know Elvira as the host of a sort of late night horror movie programming, right? Yes, sort of, I guess. Well, yes. <laughs> How, were you a horror movie fan? How did that happen? I was a huge horror movie fan. That part is coincidental, though, because how I got the job had nothing to do with being a horror fan whatsoever. It was basically um, having to do with me being a comedian. I was in the Groundlings, uh, Groundlings Improv Group in L.A. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but I think most of the cast of Saturday Night Live for the last hundred years have been, you know, stocked with Groundlings. Um, but I was in the Groundlings with the late Phil Hartman and Paul Rubens, who... Of course, it's Pee Wee. And uh, we didn't have those characters back then, though. They hadn't been invented yet. Um, so we were in the Groundlings, and uh, I heard about a gig like I normally do. I was going on auditions every day, all day. And it was for a local horror host. It paid like 300 bucks a week. And beggars can't be choosers. So I was like, oh, that'd be kind of cool. I didn't know what a horror host was. I really didn't. I had not ever seen one because. I was raised on a farm in Kansas where we were way too poor to have horror hosts, you know. Um, but it was a thing back then. Like, there were late-night horror hosts. Joe, Joe Bob Briggs, right? And uh, He was not even out yet, I don't, no, I don't, don't think. I think he I don't was think, later, but... They had, uh, in 1957, I believe, they'd had Vampyra on uh, that very channel. Um, 1951, the year I was born, they had her on. So, oh, damn. Never would have guessed that. Uh, <laughs> I just gave, gave that away. Anyway... Um, and uh, they had a, a horror host on that station named uh, Sinister Seymour. And I'd never seen him because I wasn't really watching local TV back there. I was too busy trying to be on it. Uh, so they called me in. The director had come and seen me in the show. A friend of mine said, oh, you ought to see this girl because he wanted, they wanted to do another kind of vampire type thing. Uh, which caused me a lot of problems later. I'll talk about that later. But they wanted to do a kind of sexy, spooky, you know, uh, a horror hostess. So they were looking for somebody like that. But the director really liked the comedy that I was doing, which was kind of, I had a character that was kind of a dorky valley girl actress from another you know, the valley going on auditions. And he really liked the character. So when he brought me in, he said, do that character. They chose me out of all the people who were auditioning. And then he said, I still want you to do that character, but come up with a spooky looking outfit. I mean, that character does not go with a spooky-looking outfit, did it? Anyway, that's what I did. It was like, you're paying me 300 bucks, whatever. And the, <laughs> the book here has some of your early drawings of what that spooky-looking outfit would be like. I think we have that photo. If we can pull up the photo of those early yeah. drawings. I wish they were uh, my drawings. Well, that's my first photo session. But there's a different one of actual drawings, if we can pull that. This right here. Yeah, I wish I did those drawings. That oh, was my... Did? No, my best friend, Robert Redding, at the time, who was an artist, um, who came up with the look of the, the dress, how we were going to... What direction we were going to go. He drew a bunch of pictures of how he thought the characters should look. And uh, they, they were not any of these, actually. These came later. These were costumes for my live show that we did. But uh, we had to come up with a look. My, my, uh, the way I wanted to go was Sharon Tate and the Fearless Vampire Killers. If you guys are familiar with that, with a long, flowy pink gown and long red hair. and uh, Polanski's like sort of bomb yeah. horror comedy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And kind of a dead girl look, you know, pale with pale lips and big dark eyes. And uh, when I got to the station, they were like, no, no, you got to wear all black. You got to have black hair. And I was like, oh, so, so typical. <laughs> uh, so my friend Robert um, came up with a look that was kind of part 60s girl group. Uh, he, he did the hair after the Ronettes, mm -hmm. um, Ronnie Spector. That hairdo was called a knowledge bump. And uh, he... Uh, knowledge bump? A knowledge know bump. That. It's not a beehive. It's a knowledge bump. So it doesn't work it. so much for me. But 
<laughs> anyway, and uh, uh, the, the dress was kind of very 80s. Very, I mean, we just tried to make it as sexy as possible to get the ratings, you know. And now this is the first photo shoot that you did as Elvira right here, this right? This is the first photo shoot. Is it was this for, before the show premiered or after the show premiered? It was right, uh, right around the same time, maybe the same week, because it was to put in the uh, local TV guide for, uh, you know, it says spend the weekend with me. And a, a little ads in the local TV guide. So that was what I did. And I really didn't know who the hell the character was yet. I was like, she's sexy. I, you know, instead of sitting on the couch in my first few uh, episodes, I was standing under a street light. <laughs> I mean, is that weird? You know. No, can I? No, <laughs> can I ask one of the one of the things about Elvira? Obviously, is that she's sexy, and she, you know, uses her sex appeal. And you were incredibly sexy as Elvira. Uh, did you know that you had a lot of sex appeal? Did you, did you feel like a sexy person before taking on this role? Well, I did, because I started out as a go-go girl Don't when I was 14. Don't need to be modest here, Cassandra. And, I mean, I made my entire living for years uh, uh, all about my boobs. I mean, I was <laughs> a go-go girl twirling tassels, and then I was a showgirl in Las Vegas. So this was kind of right up my alley. And I was also the the sex symbol of the groundlings. I mean, everybody who was in the groundlings at that time in the 70s knows that I was just the person they put in when they needed a, you know, a stripper, a hooker, uh, <laughs> what, whatever part. Oh, Cassandra, she can do that part. So I don't what? know, they're just... Uh, what were your feelings about that at the time at the groundlings when they would be like, Cassandra, get over here, we need a stripper. Oh, it was like, uh, yeah, absolutely, that's me. <laughs> that was, that was happy to get the opportunity. Thank oh, you. when I went on, uh, when I went on interviews, I never got parts for the young mom, you know, in the diaper commercial or the, or the the housewife or the anything. I got, I mean, I played a stripper on Happy Days. <laughs> Nobody ever played a stripper on Happy Days. I was always the saloon girl, the the whatever was the sexiest part, you know, they had. Uh, so you were you were you were initially a go-go dancer. How old were you when you became a go-go go -go dancer, and how did that happen? I'm taking off my clothes just talking about this. <laughs> no, I have to take off my jacket. I am sweating. Oh, do you want me to hold your microphone yeah, for you while I, you do it? <laughs> to be honest, in the green room, she asked me, Park Cassandra, in the green room, she was like, is it going to be hot up there? Should I wear my jacket? And I was like, it's going to be great. Wear your jacket. It looks great. You're going to be fine. My fault. I am very sorry. sorry. Uh, that's all I'm going to take off, though. <laughs> uh, uh, right now, you wouldn't want to see anything. Okay. okay um, anyway, did, what was the question? When you first became, when you, when you started as a go-go dancer, how did that happen? Uh, I, w there was a television show in the 60s called Hullabaloo, and it had all these bands on it. It was so funny, I was just reading. They had the Rolling Stones on it, and they had, I mean, huge bands that were out at the time. And uh, when the bands played, there were go-go dancers on the side, on little boxes, wearing fringy dresses and dancing in white go-go boots. And Hullabaloo... Um, had a contest that was all over the U.S. for National Hullabaloo Girl. So I went to a nightclub where I heard about a go-go girl audition, and I loved to dance. I was a dancer, and uh, I auditioned. I got this. I came in second uh, as Hullabaloo Girl, and I got a wardrobe of go-go boots, and I got uh, to be in a parade, and it was really awesome. I thought, hey, you know, maybe I can make money doing this. And the next thing, well, one of the things they uh, kind of gave me was a contract to dance at a club called Club Agogo in Colorado Springs. So I started dancing in a glass cage, you know, wearing little fringy dresses and stuff. Pretty soon it was little fringy bikinis. Uh, and and uh, I started working that way. And, and then I got an agent and I started driving all... I, w I wasn't 16 yet, but I would get in my car and drive to like North Dakota. I had no you had license. A, you had an <laughs> agent as a go-go dancer? I had a go-go dancer agent, this woman. And she would send me all over to like Cheyenne, Wyoming, North Dakota. I almost got killed a million times in blizzards and stuff. And I would drive to hotels. I'm glad that finished with in blizzards because I didn't know where that was going to be honest <laughs> yeah, no. with you. No, driving, uh, you know, uh, 14 years old in the whiteout blizzards in North Dakota in the winter. Uh, stuff like that. I'd go to like Holiday Inn and I'd go-go dance next to a, a jukebox, uh, you know, in a bar at like Holiday Inn. I mean, that's how I made my summer money as a kid when my That vacation. is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I did it during the winter. I did it during, obviously, it was, if it was a blizzard, I did it during my Christmas breaks, my spring breaks, my, 
everything and just, uh, and I worked at Fort Carson Army Base and Ent Air Force Base and the Air Force Academy, go-go dancing for the officers clubs and the, the uh, so, uh, enlisted men clubs. And, so yeah, by, the time awesome. you be, by the time you became Elvira, you were quite used to men ogling you. <laughs> oh yeah, and then I mean, I was a showgirl in Las Vegas by the time I was 17. Uh, I was actually the youngest showgirl in Las Vegas history. Uh, 17 years. That's what it says in the Guinness Book of World Records, anyway. I don't know. And, uh, and you were in a photo. You're apparently, you're not sure if it's you. No one has confirmed this nor denied it, but it might be you on the cover of Tom Waits' Small Change album. It might be. It looks like me. I think I have a better body than that girl, but maybe I was uh, just being sloppy that day. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but anyway... Like I always say to everybody, I remember the 60s very well. I remember the 80s, but I went straight from the 60s to the 80s. I don't remember anything about the 70s. I think like many in your generation like did. Like many in our generation, yeah. So now you, you get the part of Elvira on this, on this like local station, right? You're, you're, you're the horror hostess of this. And when does the character start to develop? And as the character developed, did you notice it taking off? Or did it take off after you developed it more? Um, I did it one, the first show, the first week, and there was a whole big thing about the name. I was going to be called Vampyra. So suddenly, I'm walking on to do the show, and my name has changed to Elvira. Long story. Anyway, uh, but the first week it was out, I really didn't have much hope that it was going to have a second week. And I don't think that TV station did either, because they rented my couch, and then seven years later, they were remembered they were still renting it. So it's the world's most expensive. Like every week you said it was like $300, yeah, right? Yeah, to rent, as much as I was getting paid to rent that couch. So we didn't really hold out a lot of hope. I really thought maybe I got a couple weeks of a gig here. And uh, next thing I know, people were calling me. People were on my phone. Well, it was listed in the phone book. Back then you put your phone, your, your name, you know, Cassandra Peterson, 323, you know. It was crazy. What kind uh, of calls were you getting? Mostly calls about, oh my God, can you come to my birthday party? Can you come to my, <laughs> my grocery store, my, my hair salon opening? Where, you know, come here and... and uh, I gotta be honest, it's far more innocent than I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I got a lot of those yeah. calls too. I got a lot of every kind of really crazy call, but like 24 hours a day. And I had to change my phone number and I said, oh my God, something's really happening here. And it was a couple weeks into it when I got a call from... Uh, NBC and the Johnny Carson show. And then the Tonight Show weeks? with Johnny Carson. Yeah. Wow. And I was just like, holy crap. Now I've made it. I mean, that was like the biggest and kind of only talk show there was, you know. When you got on that, you knew you were a big star. <laughs> Did you so feel ready crazy. for it? No, I was so not ready for it. I was so not ready. Um, he had me on as Cassandra Peterson and... Uh, I was so nervous and so freaked out. I, I, I messed up the uh, whole thing. But he was such a brilliant guy that, uh, unlike most of the TV ho hosts, I think, other talk show hosts, I mean, there's some very good ones, but there's also some that kind of steal the spotlight. He made the guests look good, and he could twist it around to make you look like you were brilliant, even when you were like an idiot, which I was. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, I came off good on this show, I think, and, and, and my, the popularity of Elvira kind of skyrocketed, and from that I got the Coors Light campaign, which uh, made the character visibly visible nationally. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was you got two years. movies, two of your own movies. I did, after that I got a movie uh, produced by NBC, strangely, their only feature film. And, um, <laughs> didn't go went, well for them, <laughs> their uh, only feature uh, no, film? No, it didn't go well for them <laughs> at all. A long story with that, that it sounds too sour grapes to get into it, but... Um, you get a, a taste of those sour grapes? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, oh, that, just that um, the day my film was to come out, you had huge backing, and I mean, so much money behind it and publicity, and we did a huge opening here in New York at Tavern on the Green, and a huge opening at Gromich Chinese Theater, and then the day the film came out, I was slated to be in 3,600 theaters across the U.S., and the uh, distributor went bankrupt that very day. Uh, New World, and they pulled my movie from all theaters. So it was released to like 300 theaters in the U.S. It was in San Francisco, mostly, mainly San Francisco, L.A., and uh, New York, where it was number one in those markets, above Gorillas in the Mist. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but that doesn't matter, because even if you were Star Wars, 
and your film was released in 300 theaters, you don't have any box office gross, and they're just like, okay, yeah, next. So that was the end of the movie. Now, was there ever a time where, when you were Elvira in this era, you know, there was also, you mentioned Paul Rubens, and he was Pee Wee Herman in this era, and there was this sort of element of him and his character where a lot of the audience didn't know that there was a Paul Rubens, and they almost didn't want to know that there was a Paul Rubens. Did it ever feel that way with Elvira for you? Oh, yeah, very much. Paul and I always, we're, we're really good friends, and we actually are members of a very exclusive club. It's only him and me. It's people who are characters, who stay, who own their characters and work as their characters for their whole life. Not other, no other characters, no other roles. Did you ever want another character or another role? I did in the beginning. I had in my mind, oh, and then I'll go off and I'll do this character and that character. And then uh, I'm going, what the hell are you thinking? You've got a gold mine here, for God's <laughs> sake. Just, you know, uh, uh, you know utilize it. And just, yeah. yeah, I mean... You know, yeah, I could go off. I got offers, actually, um, to do various uh, pilots for networks and everything. And, and there were pilots, of course. You don't know if they were going to go. But I would have to sit down and think, hmm, let's see a pilot. I'll get paid SAG scale after scale. And uh, so I get a few hundred dollars. I'll, I won't be around the entire fall when Elvira is really happening and making all the money. And then maybe the television show won't go. And I will have blown an entire fall where I could make many, many times that amount of money. And it might not even happen, you know. So what am I doing trying to run away from this character? I mean, it's not like you're, you're, you're you know, um, Dr. Spock or something, you know, Star Trek or Mr. Spock. You're, you're, you're not like um, you're owned by a, 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 you know, a Universal or a Paramount or whatever and you're, and every, so you the, can't go out and work, and you don't keep all the money. You keep a small percentage. It's, it's like the, I own the, the character. The station that created you didn't take ownership of the character? The character was all you? Forever? The station that created me owned the character. And every time my contract came up, it was quarterly, they, we would re, try to renegotiate, and they would say, we're not paying you any more money. And we'd say, well, could we have the rights to do a fan club? And they'd go, yeah, yeah, sure, you can have that. Next time, we're not paying you any more money. You know, I was writing the show. Sometimes I was even setting the lights. I'm You're not still doing three hundred dollars a week. I was making three hundred dollars a week, and even the show it was their number one rated show, and it didn't matter. They weren't paying me anymore, so we'd say, "Could I have the rights to go on and make guest appearances on other shows?" Yes, you can have those rights. Uh, and and every time we would ask for more rights, and one day we looked and we had all the rights. <laughs> <laughs> And they were just freaking out. Oh, my God. They called in their lawyers. They were losing it. But it, um, I didn't feel bad because I was getting no money. We, we actually did the first television broadcast in 3D in the Los Angeles area only. They sold, I, I think it was, oh, my God, I think it was 3.7 million pairs of 3D glasses at three bucks a pop. They kept the money. I got $300. And uh, so, I mean, multiply that, you know, in your head. And... Uh, so I didn't feel a bit bad about it, and I even feel better when they lost their license because of illegal contributions to the Nixon campaign later, and they were the lost Nixon their license. The Nixon campaign? So yeah. it came out in the 80s that they had illegal contributions yeah, to the Nixon campaign? Kind of, uh -huh. And it was, the, it was all the stations owned by um, uh, RKO General. They had, RKO General was the parent station to this local station. It was a big, long deal, but... They why is it always the people done who, all kinds of crazy things. Why is it always the people who donate to the Republicans are trying to rip off the little people? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Don't get me Just started on that Just throwing that one out one. there in front of this photo right here, yeah. everybody. <laughs> I should have run for president. Damn it. I could have won. So what, there was this period in the 80s where you, you knew that you had a gold mine with Elvira, but you did also kind of want to do other things. Did you go on other auditions? And you would walk in and they'd be like, wait a minute, aren't you Elvira? Well, I'd walk in and they'd go, who are you? Because really, back then, everybody, they would call me in on a, on a casting call and expect this six-foot-tall, long, black-haired Amazonian woman you know, to walk in. And I'd come in the door and they'd go, oh, my God, you're not what we were looking for at all. I go, oh, thanks. So I wasn't getting much work from, from that. It, um, nobody ever saw me as myself and didn't know I really was myself. They thought I was this person, and that's how I looked. So that's what I was getting called in on. But it, it very, it, it very quickly it became apparent that 
I did have something that was worth, uh, you know, milking for a better, lack of better <laughs> <laughs> term. Not that, that was a bad term. Um, that I should hang on to it and build it. And of course, I have m much, much help over the years. It wasn't just me by myself, many managers and uh, no agents, so I luckily don't have an agent. Uh, managers and uh, people who were involved, but saw the potential and, you know, made the, the character in, into what it is today. And it, it kind of has become an iconic co pop cultural character. So I'm glad I stuck with it. And it wasn't all uh, roses, let me tell you. Do you still like getting into the outfit, getting into the costume, and becoming Elvira when you get when you get the opportunity to do so? Do I do I feel like it? Do you enjoy it? Do I enjoy it? Uh, it's getting less enjoyable. <laughs> 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 I mean, as any woman out here knows, putting on you know a really tight dress and really hey, that's what I'm wearing now. Um, but all the makeup and all the wigs and the whole thing, I, you have to ask a drag queen. As you get a little older, it gets a little, little more uncomfortable, a little harder to do, and. Uh, yeah, but just as soon not do it that often. But when I'm in drag, I do have a blast. I have a great time then. So it's fun. You know, it is fun. It's just getting into it. That's kind of tedious after the five billionth time. You know. Co correct me if, if, if I'm wrong here, but I'm, I, if I remember correctly, during the 80s when Elvira was sort of like getting really popular, it was at the same time as sort of this like weird culture war against like metal music and horror movies as well. And Tipper Gore, I think, was a big part of that. Was Elvira a part of that as well? Was Elvira ever a target of that? For some reason, I, I vaguely remember Elvira being sort of thrown into the mix there. Of, of all the bad things that were going on? All of the things <laughs> that like people were saying, all conservatives were saying were bad for youth, essentially. Well, it, well a little bit of that. I, got, I, I would get a complaint every now and then from somebody saying my, I was showing too much cleavage. And the head of- No way. Huh? Yeah, no, this is impossible. So the head of the station would come in and go, you can't wear your cleavage that low anymore. Can you do something about fixing the dress? And, and I go, well, yeah, yeah, I'll just have it taken in. I'll have it taken up. So I would go, and I wouldn't do anything at all, and I'd come back the next week, and he'd go, did you take the dress? And I'd go, yeah. That happened all the time. They never said anything. Really? Yeah, I'd just do it every time. I wouldn't do anything at all, and I'd just tell him I had it taken in. And the other thing was... Uh, <laughs> Down, it, it was really funny. Uh, when my show became syndicated nationally, I got a, a big billboard. Like I think that picture that you showed earlier uh, that was down in the south somewhere. It was like Alabama, Mississippi, somewhere. And it billboard was up there. And they got a couple complaints. They got 12 complaints, I remember, about you shouldn't have that up on a billboard, all that cleavage, you know. And uh, so they, they put a, yeah they put a big censored banner over my instead of taking it down just a big slapped a big censored banner over it and they got hundreds and thousands of complaints so and you know what strangely was my you know and when you you're syndicated all over the country a TV show you can um, find out what market you're biggest in who's watching you most and of course when you know my biggest market was the Bible Belt was it really <laughs> yeah yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, a little hypocrisy much? Um, sort of an easy cliche question, but I'm kind of curious, since you were the horror hostess and you were showing movies, what was your favorite movie that you ever showed? Oh, my God. I showed some really bad... You know what? People love the Attack of the Killer Tomatoes almost every time I asked fans back then. But that was my worst show I ever showed because all the jokes were in the movie. I had... There were no jokes left over that were centered around ketchup or tomatoes or pizza or anything. So I had no jokes to make about that movie. Um, but I think one of my, um, I don't know, my, my first movie, Silent Night, Bloody Night, was awesome. It was, I don't know, I liked them all. I can't say for sure if I really had a favorite that, that was there. I, I don't know, they were, they were all goofy. I would start listing crazy unknown films that you never heard of. That, they were all fun, and I wrote it with my partner, John Paragon, who was also in The Groundlings. Um, and he wrote, with, uh, he was Jambi the Genie in, in uh, Pee Wee's uh, Playhouse. And John and I wrote, and we had a blast writing it. I mean, it was like Mystery Science Theater 3000 before, or 2000, whatever the number is, before they happened. And, uh, you know, just sitting there watching the movies, making comments on it in a little closet. We had to view them in a closet on a real, you know, uh, uh, reel to reel film projector. Oh, it was awesome back then. <laughs> Have you ever thought about um, sort of like maintaining the character of Elvira when you don't want to do it anymore, finding somebody else to sort of take on, take, take on the mantle? Oh, yes. I thought about that. Yeah. I thought about it so much. I had a show um, 
called, uh, what was it called? Uh, Search for the Next Elvira. Right. I'm like, I got to get another Elvira going and get out of this drag. Um, <laughs> and that, we had over 2,000 people audition, uh, um, women, guys, dogs, children, everything. <laughs> everything. And we, it came down to 12 finalists. We picked up, uh, the final girl. And uh, the, the, actually, let me back up. The background for this was I wanted to get Elvira's and put them in malls all around the country at Halloween, and people would sit on their lap and tell them what they want for Halloween. <laughs> Come on, isn't that a great idea? <laughs> actually, Elvira would sit on their laps, and she would know what they want for Halloween. <laughs> oh. Anyway, but I thought, you know, at Halloween time, you could have that, right? You know, they have the Easter Bunny, they have Santa Claus, why not Elvira? So that was my idea. And we decided to develop that one step further and find great looking Elvira's that could go out in these malls and do these gigs. Well, when we finally got the girl, we tried to send her out to places. We gave her one really sorry, sad ass job at a parade in Nebraska uh, that paid a couple hundred dollars. And then nobody else wanted to kind of sign on for a fake Elvira. I guess if you want a fake Elvira, you can dress up yourself, you know? and do it. So uh, it just didn't, it didn't pan out, didn't turn into what I wanted it to. So that's why I'm still dressing up, you know. <laughs> you, still, you still look good doing it, Sandra. Huh? You still look good oh, doing thank it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hey. uh, let's hear some questions from all of you. Hey, Cassandra, Go ahead. thank you for being here. Uh, what's the strangest Elvira merchandise you've ever seen? Oh, the strangest Elvira merchandise. Oh, well, I've got some pretty crazy ones out now. I just have a new slot machine that's pretty awesome. Slot machines are strange, I think, and pinball machines. But the oddest one, I think, was a smelly, uh, a smelly hanging thing from your car. It's like, what is it going to smell like? Was it, was it shaped like Elvira? It's, it's a little Elvira hanging from, from, you know, you hang from your mirror and it stinks to your car up. But uh, I don't know what it smelled like. But the other day, I met a fan. It was so great. This girl came and said, I was like four years old, and I was sitting in the back seat of my dad's car, and he had this little Elvira smelly thing hanging from his mirror, and I just stared at it and stared at it, and I said, I want to be just like her someday. <laughs> and she kind of was. She was all tattooed with black hair and a total goth, thing, you know, and I go, wow, so that smelly thing had a big influence on someone. <laughs> Changed her whole life, she said. Who knew? How involved in like the sort of goth world, horror world were you in the 80s? Because you came from comedy. This was a comedy character that you developed. I, I, I don't imagine that you were someone who was like specifically trying to target or get into the goth world. And goth was huge in the 80s. Yeah, it hadn't quite come around yet at, at that time, but it was coming up right in the beginning of the 80s. Here's the weird thing. I was super, super into horror when I was a kid. And my... Um, I mean, other kids, my, my sisters had Barbie and Ken. I had the werewolf, Dracula, uh, it, all these models that I would buy, at model kits and paint them. My parents, my, my mom owned a costume shop, and I dressed in creepy costumes all the time to go to school. I was a complete freak. Everyone hated me. I was always dressing up as whatever character. Like, I'd go to school dressed as I Dream of Jeannie, you know, uh, and... Um, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, gun smoke. That's a really old one reaching back. But when I was in second grade, I was parading around dressed as Miss Kitty, the saloon girl from Gun Smoke. I have a picture of me. I'm like four years old. I'm in high heels, garter belt. Not good, not good. But I had this access to these fantastic costumes. So I wore them all the time. So I was really somewhat of a freak. And of course, Halloween was the big day. And not only for my family because of their business, but because. I would always win all the Halloween costume contests. And there would be, you know, around town, whether it was for little kids or big ones, I'd have this fabulous costume that my mom and my aunt would sew for me of whatever was the hot TV show. And everybody else would be wearing those little plastic things from Sears and Roebuck, you know, with a painted on face, you know, mask. And, uh. So I won them all. I got all these $100 bonds and everything. <laughs> Still have so bond. I was deeply yeah bond a hundred dollar bond I wonder what that's worth now, um, I I was like kind of well the, here's the really bizarre story when we were making this book we were almost completely finished and my mom sent me a picture it's in the first uh, first picture of the book of me when I was five years old and 
she made my first costume. It was out of black and orange crepe paper. It was so hot. And I, I have a crown and a scepter. And she sent it to me and said, do you remember this picture? And I go, no. I go, no, I did. She said, uh, do you remember what you wanted to be? And I said, no, what is it? And she goes, you wanted to be the queen of Halloween. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, and that picture is in there. You'll see it's pretty freaky, you know. And, and that's that one of those things I'd where it's like it. we sort of, it's, it's almost like destiny, like or fate. Like we, and we naturally gravitate towards the things that we are good at, whether we know when we become adults, that's what we want to be or not. Exactly. I took the long way around. Let me tell you, like most of us do. <laughs> Ended up there. Uh, next question. What do you think it is about Avira that 35 years later she's still iconic and relevant? Oh, thank you. Um, I actually think that it's probably uh, largely to do with Halloween. I hooked my wagon to a holiday. Not, I didn't <laughs> think of this brilliant idea, but it kind of happened that way. Um, Elvira kind of comes and goes during the year, but around Halloween time in October, I'm on every TV show and radio show and pictures of me are everywhere. I'm doing live shows and personal appearances so that even if I kind of disappear the rest of the year, which I don't, I work on Elvira 365 days a year um, getting ready for Halloween, basically, but Halloween comes back around and there I am again. So my advice for any of you aspiring actors <laughs> is like just hook your, you know. Hitch your, your wagon to a holiday. Yeah, into a holiday, whatever holiday it might be. Um, but I think that's why, you know, it's become kind of like Santa Claus, you know, only without the beard. <laughs> I'm looking forward to all of your bad holiday characters in like two years on YouTube. Yeah. Do you, still have, do you still pitch like Elvira movies? Do you have scripts of Elvira movies that are sort of in the closet that you would love to produce one day? I do. I, I have many scripts that I've written in conjunction with various writers and all of that. Um, I'm getting to the point of like, I'm just tired of going out there pitching them. I have pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched, and I think I'm at the point where I, I don't really want to um, do any more live Elvira films. I, th I think I'm... I think I'm going right into animation. <laughs> and I do have a really great animated uh, a script I, I wrote that, that I might go out and pitch. But right now I'm working on an animated television show with a, a few very talented people. And we're doing a pilot for that. Very slow process animation. But you know what? You look good. <laughs> and you don't as have long to spend as I can keep my voice working. You don't have to spend the day getting dressed up either. You, just you do not have to spend the day getting dressed up. You just use your voice. You show up in your sweatpants and your T-shirt, your hat. And you're like, oh, my God, that's my dream job. <laughs> so I'm working really hard on that. Yeah, instead of, instead of like working on doing another movie and, like, you know, ending up like, you know, Joan Rivers, who I love. But I think we have time for one more question. Hey. Um, oh, so I like I your sweater. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so do you? I know you're uh, involved in the Kamikaze Expo, and uh, do you still like going to Comic Cons, or uh, like, do you have any fun Comic Con experiences? And also, do you have any upcoming uh, appearances or book signings coming up? Oh, very convenient. Yeah, um, yeah. I l I am not kidding. The more I do this, the longer I do it, the older I get, I guess, the more I love doing things like Comic-Con and the various cons that I do. Back in the beginning, there were no sort of Comic-Con type of thing. I mean, there, were, there was a San Diego Comic-Con, and I did it. And I was like, it was in a basement of some hotel, and I was the only woman there. It was all little guys traveling in little packs of two or three, you know? And for a woman to even be at Comic-Con for something was like, what's she doing here? Um, I did car shows. World of Wheels, <laughs> because there were no other places to go to sign autographs. It's so bizarre. Now, of course, I could do them almost every weekend of the year if I wanted to uh, all over the world and, and never be able to do all of them. But meeting the fans is fantastic. I, whether I dress as Elvira or myself, the fans, the stories they tell me, like the girl with the smelly thing, you know? But people saying the most wonderful, sweet things about how the character changed or influenced their life and the direction that they took in their life um, and how it helped them through school when they felt like an outsider, a misfit, they were being bullied. They said, I watched Elvira, you know, the movie, and it made me like stand. I get a, I get a little teary. <laughs> it 
I'm just, sorry. Um, I, so me, it made me feel like I was okay. I, you know, Elvira's doesn't fit in anywhere, and and not even in her dress. And <laughs> and That's I, amazing. I, I feel I'm gonna ask a, it makes it just like really gets me. I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question that may take those tears away and offset the sentimental moment. And I'm so sorry because it's beautiful. But how often at these uh, conferences? Do the people, the fans that come up to you, come up to you and say, you know, you were, when I was a 12-year-old boy, my oh, first. Uh, yeah, every, every, uh, every couple of No, gross, of I'm sorry, have, but come no. on, it's obvious. we got to ask the question. But I don't mind that because I charge them extra for photos. <laughs> yeah, so it's awesome. That's like one of those things that you know you're going to get and you're like, I know, right, I'm, I'm all ready for it. I'm like, awesome, that's great. If somebody had to do it, might as well have been me. <laughs> Uh, Cassandra, the book, is it on shelves now? It is. Uh, we're doing a big signing tonight at Barnes & Noble. Can I say that? Yeah, of course, yeah, please. Say Upper it. West Side. Um, so it, you pick up a book there. And it's very, very reasonably priced at forty nine ninety five. It's, it's beautiful. You've done a wonderful it? job putting Thank this you. together. Thank you. And I'll be signing books for everybody. Um, oh, I didn't answer your other question. I do have a convention coming up in March. I think it's... Because uh, pinball, I, uh, my pinball machines have been like voted like one of the best pinball machines ever made. So that's kind of true. Your pinball machines yeah. are amazing. I remember thank that you. now. Thank you. And uh, so I'm doing a big pinball convention, which is something I haven't done before. But that'll be fun because I love pinball. Um, so, uh, but anyway, the, the, I'm out there. The book is mostly available on Elvira.com or Tweeterhead.com, which a Tweeterhead is the company uh, that put this together for me. I could have never done it without them. Let me tell you, I sat around thinking about it for about 35 years. Somebody finally did the legwork for me and, and did an amazing job, I think. So um, anyway, tweeterhead.com or elvira.com. And I think you can still get it in time for Christmas if you do it before the 17th, which is just two more days. So. Keep well, Cassandra, up. a.k.a. Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Thank you.